Hey folks, and welcome back to Dungeons & Dry Brushing. Now if you saw my last video, you saw me take a $2 dollhouse and start to convert it into an ancient temple for my game. Well, now today we get to do the part where the real magic happens. I get to go through and turn all of those empty play spaces into story-rich environments for my game. We're going to be talking a little bit about how to craft scatter for this kind of environment, what sort of things you can use to make interesting objects, but we're also going to touch on story and theme and storytelling through scatter, which is just one of my favorite things. So, let's get started. I'm going to be starting with the area for sacrifices. Religious rites involving sacrifice were a grim reality, and I want to echo that in my game. I don't really expect my players to engage in this themselves, but it could be a good way to add some sinister undertones to NPCs. Now, if your players aren't murder hobos, then they're naturally going to distrust anyone that engages in sacrificing living things to achieve their goals. The tone of my game is not particularly grim or bloody, though, and I tend to find that a little bit of gore stretches a lot further and actually has a way higher impact than just splashing blood everywhere does. Now, if blood and gore doesn't crop up often in your setting, then your players will be apt to react to it when it does. If Instead, you treat it like Mortal Kombat, and every time an enemy dies, they explode like a Ziploc bag full of red goo shot out of a potato cannon, then it just becomes a sort of non-event. Oh, the NPC exploded like an overripe melon? Uh, don't worry, that's just what happens when you take 1d4 damage around here. So for this, I want to have some blood and gore, but I don't want to go over the top with it. It's all about restraint. As a focal point for that, I start by creating an altar. I'm using an old wooden bob that I had around, but this could easily be done with foam as well. I spray the altar with a dark green to start, and then use the old trick of wrapping a used dryer sheet around it and overspraying it again with white to get a simple marble effect. I also dry fit it in the temple to see exactly where I want it before gluing anything down. While sacrificing animals or people was a messy business, this is a temple, not a slaughterhouse, so they still try to keep things clean. So, like so many bags of sand for the rides at Disney World, they'd have to have a way to clean up the mess. Now, I'm just going to go back to a trick I used for the first time in a recent build for making hay, the bristles of an old house painting brush. I just cut off a lot of these, I'd rather have too much than too little, and the extra can be kept in a jar for later. This is going to surround the altar and just get completely soaked in white glue. I want this as saturated as possible so that all of it sticks down. I want this to look like big, heaping piles of hay all around the sacrifice altar. To really lock it in place, I mix up some white glue and water and use a pipette to completely saturate the hay. I want it to be absolutely soaked just to be sure it's going to stick where I put it. Now that's going to take quite a while to dry, so in the meantime I'm moving across the temple to work on the area with the bathing and cleansing rites. For that I've decided on one giant copper tub or fountain, a small hand basin, and a dais from which a temple priest might deliver religious rites while you're cleansed. Now, uncomfortable as the idea might be for us, public bathing and cleansing rituals were both incredibly common through much of the ancient world, so once again that's getting dragged into my setting, kicking and screaming. And again, this is something that can be played up in multiple different ways. You could have fighters and gladiators anointed with oils and herbs on the eve of battle. Or if your players are going on a quest to hunt a particularly dangerous beast or monster, maybe your ranger or druid can track down herbs to use here in the baths that will help to cover their scent while they track down the monster, giving them some specific bonus to stealth. Or, given that it is a type of water ritual, you could even have characters that are sailors or pirates ask for blessing from spirits and gods of the ocean before going on a long journey. If you want your players to engage in this kind of material, then these are all things that could be extended into full quest lines. Branch it off into choices that express morality. Maybe the herbs that they find to help disguise their scent could also be used as medicine by a local woman that helps children. What's more important to them? Their stealth bonus or their character's morality? Or if you have a character who is a gladiator being anointed with oils before a big fight, maybe they find out that a certain type of oil, while completely undetectable, is going to make it much harder to grapple them. 
though it's illegal to use. Does the character value victory and glory, or honesty and pride? And even better, these can all integrate with the themes and stories of the setting and are things we can easily reflect in the scatter terrain that we're putting in the temple. With that in mind, I dug out an old bit of reaper scatter that shows some pots, jars, and a bag of herbs. Perfect for setting beside the copper tub to hint at those quest ideas we talked about. And I decided to throw in a few very dramatic looking candles as well, painted in gold both to express the wealth of the temple and because nothing screams slightly ominous religious ritual quite like candlelight does. This is a good time too to block everything out and make sure that miniatures can actually still play and fit in the space. Sure, the copper tub takes up a lot of room, but I figure if a fight should happen here, the players can always get in the tub if they choose and treat it as difficult terrain. With our bathing area ready to go, it's time to leap back to our sacrificial altar. The glue is dry now, so it's time to add the finishing touches. I water down a mix of Army Painter's Red Tone and Soft Tone to make old bloodstains. I dollop this on the altar itself, the stone around it, and into some piles of hay. Now washes are already translucent, and watered down like this, it's going to look quite faint and old, like someone has tried to scrub it out, but it hasn't fully worked. Again, this is a hint at the awful things that go on here without being too over the top. Now to really drive home the grossness of blood rites, I paint up a small brass pot and add some fresh blood to it using the Blood for the Blood God technical paint. A little gore goes a very long way. To finish off the bottom floor of the temple, I was originally going to craft a door that leads into the catacombs beneath, but while I was looking through my piles of scatter, I found this big rug. And since the catacombs aren't really a public space, or even a place that the priests like going, I figured I'd throw this down instead and say it's covering the door. It's not only less conspicuous, but it's a chance to add some color and life to the temple, and it can make for a nice dramatic reveal when the players finally figure it out. I suppose I must have been feeling ambitious that day too because I dusted off my rarely used freehand skills to add a Greek key inspired pattern to the edges of the rug. Now it's far from perfect, but at a glance at tabletop distance, I think it's passable, and freehand is one of those things that you just never get better at if you don't try it. That brings us to the second floor of the temple. Now, if you recall from my last video, this is what I called a spirit garden. It's part of my own setting and part of the primary faith in the area this is set in. The locals worship dozens or even hundreds of different spirits. The domain of a spirit can range anywhere from a particular stretch of road or even a single farmstead to being a spirit of giant concepts like love, revenge, or war. Now, particularly wealthy or pious members of the temple will donate statues and plaques to honor their favorite spirits and give other locals a place to come and make offerings directed to the spirits of their choice. These offerings can range from simple things, food, flour, herbs, clay pots, straight to offering gems, piles of gold, full meals, or exquisite works of art. So representing this naturally meant digging through my collection of miniatures, scatter bits, and beads for anything that might be appropriate. This is part of why I keep 3D printed minis that are out of scale the first time I print them or where a piece breaks off. They still make for great statues or can be used for basing. All of the larger statues get matched with a plinth. These range from wooden baubles to old tea containers to the cap from a wine bottle, and they all get painted in a dark metallic and dry brushed a lighter one. One or two of the statues receive washes as well, but the majority don't. I don't want to do anything to tamp down the shine on those metallic paints. While the spirit garden is obviously a place of worship and your PCs could come here for that, don't forget the other aspects that might be useful for plots. This is especially true if you're running a game that involves some political intrigue. Senators and advisors might meet here under the cover of dark to discuss aligning their political interests. Or if there is a mystery, perhaps a murder mystery and your player characters are looking to establish motive, 
perhaps staking out the spirit statues for concepts like revenge, righteous combat, or even stealth and poison might elicit clues as to who owes which spirits a favor or two now. Or if you want to run a lighter plotline that can still tug on the heartstrings, maybe a local druid or ranger has, after many years of loyal service, lost his best friend and animal companion. Now he's had a statue made in their honor, and even though it's not strictly true that his favorite pet is a spirit now, he'd like the statue to be enshrined in the temple. After all, who wouldn't do that for their favorite pet and their very goodest boy? So now the players have to either sneak the statue in or convince the local priest to allow it. Either way, they probably have their work cut out for them. And while those are all very different tones of story, they also all tie the way we craft into the types of stories we tell. And you know how much I love that. For the other side of the Spirit Garden, I'm going back to take inspiration from my setting once again. One of the ongoing subplots in the setting is that one particular spirit called Meros, who is a spirit of righteous combat and pageantry, in life he was a gladiator, has started to become too popular. Young senators, merchants, affluent generals, and money men throughout the realm are beginning to worship him almost without exception. It's fashionable to do so, and also a way to buck what they see as the traditions of their stodgy elders. Now, some would say that this is a betrayal of their entire faith. They do not worship gods here, and Meros is starting to become deadly close to being seen as one. Others would say that they're doing nothing that's against the law or doctrine, and no one can tell them how to worship. Either way, I need a statue of Maros, and it needs to have not just the most offerings around it, but the most opulent and wealthy offerings. While a single plinth of metal or wood might be good enough for others, Maros needs two tiers of marble. While other spirits get clay pots, flowers, and simple foods, the wealthy patrons of Maros leave crystal vases, gems, and gold coins, and entire cartloads of luxurious fabric, scented oil, and even offerings of a broken shield and shattered spear that were taken from powerful fallen opponents. He also gets an entire room to himself. This not only implies the much greater number of worshippers that come to temple for Meros than any other spirit, but it also gives us an excuse to leave this room with a bigger open space in the center, and this will help make it more playable in addition to leaning into the story. Now it's finally time to do something with that elevator. These are copper panels that I picked up from the dollar store years ago. I have no idea what they're originally for, but today they're fulfilling the gap in the elevator where I'm going to put a brazier, a beacon at the very top of the temple that they light every morning to let the city know to come worship and that it's time to start their daily labors. I happen to already have a few braziers printed and painted, so this time it's as simple as slotting one into the right spot. And now it's onto the armory. I have two weapon racks. This one is from Reaper and has a lot of generic fantasy weapons, and the other is 3D printed with Greek and Roman gear. They're both going up in the armory, along with a training dummy, some armor, some tables, and a Roman standard or Signa Romanum. I imagine the head of the order is a former military man, or perhaps the military actually has a detachment of clerics and paladins that serve with them. Either way, the head of the paladin order that serves out of this temple takes his job very seriously, and that's reflected in the armory. This could be a character that ends up as a reluctant ally to the PCs if they end up rooting out corruption in the temple. Or he could be the hammer that gets brought down on them if they screw around too much on temple grounds. Or they could even be the superior officer of one of your players, if they're playing a cleric or paladin themselves, a major NPC that one of your characters goes to for advice and guidance, or just to report in with their Monty Python-esque adventures. That's all in the tone. There are lots of fun ways a group of hard-bitten paladins could fit into this kind of campaign, though, from quest givers and mentors to part of the local infrastructure that views adventurers as just another brand of bandit and troublemaker they're forced to deal with. Now, I know a lot of the time DMs like to make that a problem for the town guard, and while there's nothing wrong with that, it's best not to underestimate the influence of religion in ancient power structures. Speaking of which, that brings us to the office of the head cleric. I picked out a few items from my collection of scatter terrain to slide into his office. 
a desk, a chair, some candles. I also decided to go with a mystical looking orb and a... Actually, I have no idea what that's supposed to be. Maybe a birdbath? Whatever, it's a scrying pool now. Or even a place to anoint himself with blessed oils and herbs. I decided to start with a slightly more austere look for the head cleric, a person whose faith and belief sustains them, and who doesn't keep the riches of the temple for themselves. A person who either truly is content to have only the most humble version of the tools that their station requires, or at the very least who wants to be seen as that kind of person. Perhaps deep down there is a difference between how they wish to be seen and how they really are, and I decided to add a hint to that in their office as well. The hint comes in the form of a picture, a large painting hanging on the wall. Now this could be a lot of different things depending on how you play it. It could be a sign of wealth and ostentation that they just couldn't resist. A small hint to their secretly greedy, corrupt nature. Or you might notice that the painting is of gladiators. In a callback to earlier, it could be a sign that on some level our head cleric is a worshipper of Maros too, like I talked about before. He loves the games and the gladiators who play in them. Or if you're truly devious, it could just be a red herring. The head cleric is neither wealthy nor a worshipper of Maros, but the painting was done by a good friend or even a family member, and they're so immensely proud of their friend that they couldn't resist putting it on display in their office. Rather than being a sign of greed, it's actually an indication of their immense love and compassion for their friends. And with that done, it's finally time. Let's roll the glamour shots. The finished transition from a cheap yard sale dollhouse to an ancient fantasy temple. So this is the final product and I couldn't be happier with how it has turned out. I think it strikes a great balance between looking like it's full of stuff and lived in and like people and characters spend part of their day here and live their lives here and playability. And that's always a difficult balance to strike, especially when you want an environment that is just dense with objects. But I think I did pretty good this time on it. On top of that, there are all kinds of hints in the scatter about the environment and the story and the people who live here and the kinds of stories that might take place here in the temple. Lots of intriguing hooks that might bring the players in or get them to ask, well, what's that? Or who is that? Or why is that there? And those are the kind of things that you can use to draw your players into plots or story ideas, to draw them into things that, you know, might otherwise just pass them by. And on top of that, of course, I got to go through all of my scatter bins and drawers and clean stuff out and use some of those pieces that I've been accumulating over years, and that's always fun. So I'm going to call this one a success. Not only is it a very cool play space, and I think it's turned out with a lot of story-rich environments and cool ideas built into it, but on top of that, it's really huge, like it's quite big in comparison to the rest of the buildings that I have in the setting, and I think that speaks volumes about the importance of this temple to the people who live in the city I'm creating. All right, folks, thank you for joining me. Thank you for taking the time to watch. Please hit like if you liked the video, and if you want to see more, please hit subscribe. There is always more on the way. In fact, I'm thinking about turning this maybe into a series of videos, crafting scatter for different buildings or different environments, let me know if that might interest you. If you want to help support the channel, there are links to do that below and it would mean the world to me to do that. And as a little bonus for those of you who stuck around, I realized that in my last video, I broke one of the cardinal rules of the internet. I, I talked about my pet without showing my pet. And he's doing great, by the way. Thank you to those of you who asked. But uh, just before we go, yeah. There he is, so enjoy, <laughs> and I'll see you on the next one.